Um, so this, I hope Tom doesn't mind me saying, but um, th this is, I hope, a step from the ridiculous to the sublime, but um, I, I leave you to judge. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, the problem of health, uh, health systems in low and middle income countries. Um, and in particular about the transition that many of them are trying to make towards universal health coverage. And let's be clear, by universal health coverage, they don't mean covering all health care. They mean covering every person with a basic level of health insurance. Uh, Margaret Chan, the Director General of WHO, claimed that um, universal health coverage was the single most powerful idea of public health. Well, actually, that's completely wrong. Universal health coverage is a powerful idea from public finance. The basic issue of universal health coverage is that it is making big financial transfers, usually, from rich people and healthy people to poor people and sick people. It's a redistributive mechanism giving them uh, a certain amount of health insurance uh, in the form of health coverage. Now, um, of course, countries are able to do that to different extents. Um, so uh, that transfer from the rich uh, and the young and the healthy, the amount you can transfer depends, first of all, on your political willingness, the country's political willingness to make that redistribution, and secondly, on the total resources that the country has, just how wealthy it is. So the key issue, in my view, in these countries that are trying to make the transfer towards universal health coverage is um, how much to transfer and what to do with the money that comes from that. They can't do everything. Many countries can do very little indeed. The average spending in low-income countries on healthcare is about $40 per head. In high-income countries, it's $4,000, something like that. Um, so what can they do? Well, I've been terrifically... Uh, uh, it's been wonderful to see some countries, the progress that they're making, and the bravery that is being shown by their political leaders in choosing what aspects of health care they are going to provide from the public insurance that the universal health coverage gives. Um, and some of them, make, they are having to make very hard choices, but they're making them clearly, they're creating entitlements, and they're telling um, the population uh, clearly what they can have and what they can't have. Um, and indeed, it's just worth noting in relation to what Mark was saying earlier, that actually that also creates, for those who have enough resources, it creates um, a market for complementary insurance or purchase of health care uh, which is not covered by the public sector and I think that clarity is also proving helpful. Um, so I salute those countries that are making that transition but I can't resist just coming back to contrast it with what's going on in many high income countries which seems in comparison remarkably self-indulgent and decadent compared uh, to the best efforts in uh, mainly middle-income countries. I have to say, I, I, I'm not aware of too many very low-income countries that are, uh, are solving this. Um, we're seeing, um, in response to apparent uh, financial difficulties, we're seeing fudge, obfuscation, and fingers being crossed uh, about the future. Um, I think the, it's absolutely imperative if we're to sustain our systems of universal health coverage, which, by the way, have been perhaps the single biggest contribution to welfare, social welfare improvements over the last 50 years. They're incredibly, uh, as Tom was suggesting, large numbers gained from this. Um, uh, if, we're to, if we're not to imperil those gains, I think politicians have to be much more clear about what they are providing what they are not providing, and allow populations to vote on whether they are prepared to accept cuts to what's being provided, or if they're prepared to pay more in the form of taxes or other public uh, finances uh, to actually provide a bigger package of care. 
So the single biggest challenge I think we have is to make politicians aware of the huge welfare benefits of having a system of universal health coverage, make them uh, 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 do the right thing, ethically the right thing, in implementing that, and to make them brave so that they can actually uh, sell that to their, uh, the public, that what they're getting in return for their payments is worth the money. And I think there's, um, that's a very big challenge for them. But um, I would be absolutely heartbroken, uh, especially as you get into retirement, to see the um, health system beginning to crumble uh, simply because of a lack of courage amongst our politicians. Thank you very much. And let me say, as a recent migrant, that, uh, Tammy, I completely agree with you that migration is the, the A, anyways, humongous challenge, not only for healthcare systems, uh, but for social welfare systems more generally uh, in Europe. And certainly, Canada is not excluded. Uh, the government of Canada recently removed health insurance for refugees uh, in a very strange move to save some money. Uh, we're hoping that will be reversed now that the Prime Minister is packing his suitcases uh, this week. But that's not what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, when Adam gave me the opportunity to comment on a paper uh, for the journal, I was asked to comment on an excellent paper by uh, Ting Hong and colleagues that explored what parts of healthcare are suitable for private financing. And in doing so, I turned the idea around as I think that one, anyways, of the key issues that most systems, and certainly the one that I come from, are struggling with today is actually what to fund publicly, or what's the core of a publicly financed uh, healthcare system. And this used to be easier. Uh, stuff done in hospitals or by doctors was considered core. I'll note that in my country we haven't evolved beyond that yet. Uh, but the task is considerably more difficult now. And having a systematic way of considering what is appropriate for public funding that goes beyond how or by whom or where the care is delivered seems to me to be uh, our best chance of having our publicly financed institutions evolve along with the technology of healthcare delivery and system management. And inherent in any framework that tackles this uh, is what to do for people who, who want more, better, or, or faster service. That is, how do we tackle the private side, which was what the original paper looked at, of healthcare financing. But I think that first we need to get the public side right. It makes dealing with the private um, a lot easier. And I note in the comment that uh, despite all the flaws in the Affordable Care Act, you know, one of the important steps it takes in this regard, which I think is very useful, and it recognizes that the health needs of the population change much more slowly than the technologies to best meet these needs, and that we have many of the same health problems that we had 50 years ago, uh, but we deal with them much differently. And therefore, we should be designing the public benefit around health needs uh, and not around providers or treatments. And the question then shouldn't be, uh, should insulin be covered or should services by psychologists be covered, but rather what's the most effective way of treating diabetes and mental health? I will note that Canada covers neither insulin nor uh, services by psychologists, but perhaps uh, it should evolve one step ahead and think about how do we actually treat these diseases. It would lead to the natural answer of what they should cover. Uh, and then we're left dealing with the words most effective, and those are not easy words to deal with. Uh, but I think that advances both in technology assessment, and the UK, of course, is leading the way here, and assessing and encouraging best practices among physicians. And I, and I actually think that, that um, certain sectors of the US, like Intermountain or the Mayo Clinic, are, are offering us reasons to be optimistic that we can make progress in these areas uh, simultaneously. I'm actually hoping the UK will figure out how to take successful models uh, in small settings that we observe elsewhere and scale them up to the system level, I think that would be uh, a huge, hugely important uh, thing that many systems could benefit from. So what does this actually mean? It, it suggests a, a broad base of coverage, and for most countries this is going to be broad universal coverage, although it doesn't have to be. Uh, it suggests that it doesn't make sense to have a system like the one I'm coming from where entire categories of care are left to the private sector, whether that's pharma or mental health. Um, the minimum standard should be very well supported by evidence and, and should lead to a relatively high level of quality. And this requires uh, both evaluation not only of new drugs and technology, but greater uniformity over what doctors and other practitioners actually do. And the goal of promoting uh, the most cost-effective method of treatment should not be undermined by the private sector. And therefore, 
private financing that alters the incentives of the public system uh, should, I think, be discouraged. And the trickiest cases here uh, come from some of the countries that I'm either from or spending time in. I think the mutuelles in France and the supplementary insurance in Canada both actually are set up to undermine um, what we're trying to achieve in the public system in some part, and I think we need to think about that going forward. What are the implications for private financing then? Well, I think that technologies, procedures, and options not well supported by evidence as cost-effective need to be left to the private domain, and therefore the private domain can be defined by treatment for which there are uh, more cost-effective options or for items that we don't consider part of the broad essential need of a population. And of course this will uh, still lead to some perceived inequalities uh, in access, but if we get it right, uh, any contribution of the private sector to inequalities in access won't add to the inequalities in health and quality of life, and I think that would be a success. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.